Yeah, so uh, Yong is uh, in Ontario this way. So mm -hmm. we asked him to introduce you. So, yeah, uh, welcome everyone. So today we have uh, Ben Conant mm -hmm. to present his experience on program analysis, I guess. Yeah, right. that's it. Right. Program analysis and uh, its applications to malware detection. Mm -hmm. detecting for, for security applications. So then, it's where I'm Thank you guys. Um, so this is a, this is actually a, kind of a fun talk for me. This was a combination of two talks. I gave a talk at DerbyCon, which is a professional security conference. Um, and I gave that talk in 2014, and I was looking at kind of uh, hard problems in malware analysis, and uh, as a result of something that we learned on the DARPA project uh, here at Iowa State. Um, and then uh, I wanted to give kind of a demonstration of that uh, near the end of that talk, and I found that I really didn't have the, the tools to, to be able to build the type of malware that I was talking about. Um, and so for the kind of the first time, I, I decided to do something offensive, and I wrote a tool um, that would help me write these kind of malware-based rootkits. Um, and I wanted it to be really easy so that anyone with, like, say, uh, CompSci 27 could be able to write these, these type of uh, rootkits. Um, so I built that, and then I presented that at DEF CON this summer. Um, so this is kind of uh, the merging of those two talks and kind of uh, has some lessons learned in between. Um, so first, I'll just give you a little background. Um, so I did my master's here. I finished my master's in 2012. Uh, and then I, I stayed here at Iowa State, and I uh, started working in the Starbo program. Um, and I did that for three years, and then in the fall uh, here, I, I started my PhD. So I've been here a really, really long time, going on 11 years now. Um, but this was a this was a pretty interesting experience for me. So this DARPA program was um, kind of based off of uh, the Department of Defense's uh, requirements. So what they wanted to do is um, not have to write their own software, right? So they want to be able to outsource um, someone uh, some some work to someone to, to develop their software. Um, but if it's not developed within that kind of Department of Defense. Uh, you know, the confines of the, of the DOD, they may not trust it as much, right? So we need to have some sort of process to go through and audit all of the software that we bring into the organization. And uh, at the time this program was proposed, there was a um, kind of a, Congress had blocked a big purchase of routers from uh, Huawei, a Chinese company, um, because they had noticed that some of the routers were recording network traffic and sending it home to China in the middle of the night. Uh, so they're worried about these kind of back doors or little hidden malware pieces. Um, and we need to have some process to, to find those. Um, so the, the program was kind of organized this way, um, and, and these are all kind of what you would call zero-day attacks. Um, you have to be able to kind of find these, these hidden backdoors the first time, not after we've seen uh, several instances of the backdoor working right. Um, so we spent a lot of time and a lot of money on this, and, and we learned, okay, it's really hard. Um, <laughs> so right, you don't just find malware, um, and so that was, the kind of whole lesson learned um, and what I wanted to give this talk and try to give examples of why you can't just find malware, right? You don't just write a little program uh, and, and find the malware because most of the time we don't even, I can't even give you a definition of what malware is. Um, and so we'll come to that. Um, so what, what to expect in this talk, right? I just told you I don't have the answers. Um, so really, you know, you don't have the answers. Um, so really what I want to do is step back and just ask some questions and get, get people to think. Um, and the goal is to kind of start a discussion and maybe something will come out of it. Maybe not, maybe. So let's just do a little icebreaker, right? Um, so what do you think? Does the antivirus protect us from modern malware? No? Okay, a lot of no's. Okay, how about, uh, how about yesterday's malware? Maybe, okay. What about last year's malware? Okay, yeah, a lot of yeses. Or antivirus is just totally worthless, don't even bother. I don't, I don't run antivirus anymore, so, but that's just my opinion. Um, okay, so I did a little experiment, um, and I did this in 2014. So at this time, this malware was two years old. It took a, a, just a simple piece of Java malware. Um, it was a, an exploit against the Java virtual machine um, that would give you uh, execution privileges. Um, so you could set up a web page, and if someone goes to that web page, you could run arbitrary code. Um, and I just started just refactoring. Right? Um, it's just real simple things. So I go through uh, the name of the, the exploit was in the class name, so I just changed it to like good stuff, software or something like that. Uh, there's a method called disable security, so I renamed it to enable security. 
right? Just little things like that. And uh, we dropped quite a few antiviruses just real quick. They start dropping like flies. And then I have a few more techniques. I have the source code there if anyone wants to look at it. Um, you start adding things like reflection, and they just, they're just dropping all over the place. All the, the antivirus are just falling apart. And so there's a site called Virus Total. It runs the current version of every antivirus, all the commercial antivirus products. Uh, every day you can upload any sample you want, and it reports you know, how many antivirus detected. Um, and at the end, you can just create like a simple little um, kind of packer. It's a, kind of a common uh, obfuscation technique. Um, and this is the simplest one that I could think of. Uh, and zero antivirus detected this. This is two years old. Um, I did this manually, but you can like do this in like three seconds, uh, write a little automated program to do it. In fact, I did, right? Um, so yeah, nobody could detect that after two years, right? Um, so let's, let's just think about this. So what is malware, right? So the best definition I have is just malicious software, right? Kind of the, the, the roots of the word. Um, so this is kind of this umbrella term for everything. It's viruses, worms, trojans, backdoors, ransomware, everything. Right? We're just going to group them all together and call it a malware. Um, and then let's, while we're at it, define what a bug is. Right? So if you just kind of Google it, um, you get Wikipedia, they say it's things like rounding errors, kind of an unintentional error, a flaw, a failure, a fault. Um, so my question for you guys is, is software bug malware? What do you think? No? Okay, but what if I put it there? Like if I intentionally add a bug to your code, right? So I think it has something to do with intent, right? But we can't tell the developer's intent just by looking at source code. And so to prove my point, I'm gonna give you some examples. These are real life examples. Um, so what do you think? Is this a bug or a malware? There's something wrong with this code for sure. So you guys can ask me questions if things don't make sense or if you need more information. Anything wrong? Anybody see the problem? Yeah. You need double equals. Okay, yeah, double equals. So um, let's give a little context. Um, this was found in the Linux kernel, right? Um, and this line never executes. Why? Okay, because there's a, there's a, there's a big difference between one equals and two equals, right? So what, let's read it how the, how it was supposed to be, right? Or it looks like a um, like what the intent was, right? So um, wall looks like a compiler flag. W clones another compiler flag. So this is like warnings, all the warnings. So if the compiler uh, is the flag is warnings all, um, and the current user ID UID is zero, what do we think that what's that user ID? What's user ID zero in Linux? Root. Yeah, got it, right? Okay, so if the user ID is zero, then let's just return some error because you shouldn't be compiling with root, something like that, right? But this doesn't do that. This says, if this is true, and set the user ID to zero, so it makes you root, right? Uh, and when you, um, the reason this compiles is because when you assign a value, the result of that assignment is whatever the right-hand side is. So what's the zero in C? False. Right, so if true and false, which is always false, never runs this line. But after this is done, you're, you're root, right? So all you have to do is figure out how to trigger this check in your root. So it's a hidden back door, right? So someone added this, they actually um, kind of have an interesting backstory. They had two repositories. They had something like SVN and they had a, a Git repository. And some people didn't like Git, there's an argument. Right? Actually, I did CVS. Um, some people really liked CVS, which is a terrible, uh, version control system in my opinion. But anyway, um, so someone had hacked into the second repository and every now and then they would take the, all the commits from the second repository and merge them into the main branch. Um, they had hacked into that um, and added this little check. They'd also fixed a bug, so it was kind of a, a good fix, right? Uh, except for this line. And um, they were hoping it would get merged into the main branch and now we have like a, a weaponized exploit against Linux because we know we put it Right? Um, and it got caught only because this was a commit without a commit ID, which is impossible in a version control system. Uh, so someone thought this is really weird, and then they started doing some investigation and they found this. Right? So this was a, a real attempt in 2003. Uh, we don't know we did it, but... Okay, so um, this might be hard to read, um, so I'll kind of point out the important parts. So this was in uh, Apple's SSL implementation. And um, so if you look right here, um, 
you can see there's the minuses and the pluses. This is a, a get difference. So you see uh, an extra go to was added right here. Right? Um, so you have if, and you don't have brackets on the if. So if this is true, you go to some fail cleanup code. Um, but otherwise, this go to always executes. Right? So it kind of was a, a, an accidental like merge difference or something, right? Which means that this if never executes, right? So we always go to fail when we get to this part. So we have to ask ourselves, what does this line of code do? Well, so this is SSL, so say you connect to Amazon on your, on your MacBook, and um, you go to Amazon and go through all these checks, uh, and the very last check basically says something like, um, did all the checks that I just asked, is this actually the server that, that gave me all these things? Right, so this is, this is actually probably the most important check of everything because it kind of ties it all together. So this check never happened. So as long as you pass all the previous checks um, in, in this, this check, which kind of uh, pulls it all together, um, you can set up a completely fake Amazon Web Server. Uh, and this is a pretty terrible bug um, because it affected, affected the MacBook, it affected all of the Apple products, the iPhone, the iPad, all that, um, because of the shared code base. Um, and I tried it on this laptop and it worked just fine, right, until it fixed it. Um, so it never verifies the server authenticity. Um, and the funny thing is this is flagged as dead code by even GCC if you just have the compiler warning turned on. So how did they miss that? Um, and how did they miss that for almost a year is, is pretty uh, scary. Uh, unless you, the thought crosses your mind that maybe someone put that there. I don't know, right? So this is one that I, I think you can look at and you can say, this is a bug or malware? I don't know because you can't prove intent, right? You have some plausible than I build. Um, okay, so I have a few more. Um, this one, they're, they're getting harder and harder to read and harder to, to understand, right? So this one is also SSL, it's open SSL, so um, people might think, uh, remember this as Heartbleed. Um, so basically Heartbleed has this, this protocol, right? So if you uh, create a connected encryption, um, a, a tunnel to, to another server, and then you're not gonna do anything for a long time, you're just gonna wanna sleep. You don't want that, that connection to die. So they have a protocol called the heartbeat, which basically says, uh, I'm just gonna check to see if you're still there and remind you like, I'm, are you still there, are you still there? So what you do is you create a random message, you send it to the server, and the server has to echo that message back to you. And if it echoes the right message back, then you know it's still there, right? So you have kind of a challenge. Um, and the way that this works, the protocol said, you will specify how long of a message you wanna send. It's between one and 64 kilobytes. And uh, then you actually send the message. Uh, and on the server, what it does is it looks at the size, it allocates an array of between one and 64 kilobytes, depending on how big the message is, uh, and then copies your message into that array and sends it back. So there's a problem, because what happens if I uh, say, I'm gonna send you a 64 kilobyte message, and then I only send one byte? Well, the, array, uh, the server allocates an array of 64 kilobytes big, copies your one byte message in and sends it back to you, right? Well, what happens in C when you allocate an array? It's just whatever happened to be in memory before that array was allocated, right? So they, they didn't zero out this array. Um, so as a result, you get um, 64 kilobytes minus one byte of just whatever was on the server's memory before, right? And you just keep asking, you keep doing this over and over again. Uh, and, those, and eventually you find some interesting things that were just in memory. Um, and in fact, you could do this really easily. You could get session cookies um, really quickly. Um, uh, Cloudflare had a big challenge. You could actually get the, the SSL private key, um, which is a pretty scary thing, but you had to ask a lot of times. Um, so this one was Heartbleed. Uh, this is a pretty big deal. It affected like a third of the internet. We, we got our first like logo for a bug, which is kind of fun. Um, and this one's much less obvious. Static analysis tools really didn't find this because people created allocation, or, sorry, macros to do this uh, array allocation stuff. Um, and so they kind of, it gets a more complicated and it's hard to audit this stuff. Okay, um, so it survived several like intensive code audits, right? People are looking at OpenSSL all the time. It was there for two years. There was a big rumor that the NSA knew about it for about two years, which means you know, they knew about it, or maybe they pushed someone to put it there, right? Who knows? Um, you can, can have all your conspiracy theories. Um, okay, so here's another one. I, I won't even go too deep into it, but this is, uh, this is the uh, shell shock bug. Um, basically, uh, you could specify an environment variable that would get you to run a function. Um, if you, or sorry, you could, yeah, run a function, uh, run a command after you specify the function. Um, and 
this was missing some important validation checks. Um, this bug was actually 25 years old, so you could do this for a long time. Um, and uh, yeah, so 25 years, um, it's missing uh, validation checks. Although at the time they wrote this, they weren't really thinking about security that much. They were just happy it worked. Um, but this one was really complicated to find, um, and uh, there was kind of a big race for who was going to create the logo this time around. Um, and there was quite a few. I think this one won. This one's cool because it actually has the bug in it. So, okay. So I thought this one. This is Java code. And I, I wouldn't have any idea if, uh, if I saw this. Right? Bug malware. Well, it's weird. I'm just going to call it malware, right? It, there's I don't see any bug. But um, if you take this code and you actually combine it, um, uh, if you wait and you combine it with something else, uh, you wait for something like a cosmic ray to hit your RAM and flip a bit, or heat flips a bit in your RAM, you have some sort of hardware error. Uh, this is just setting up a structure that you could take advantage of for a write what where scenario, which means you can actually violate the type system, or sorry, once the type system is violated, you can um, create this scenario where you can run arbitrary code in memory and actually escape the Java sandbox. Right. So uh, in this case, the, there's nothing really wrong with the program because the type system asserts certain things will always be true. But once your hardware fails, you can take advantage of that. Right. Um, and so this is a fun paper. They actually um, took a heat lamp that would like shine it on the RAM to get this to work, and they could uh, they could you know estimate that these cosmic rays would hit like once a month. So if you had this code running, you could actually escape the sandbox after a certain amount of time once your hardware starts to fail. Uh, okay. So that's my point. Right. We're just showing software examples, and, and my point is like. These are hard to find, right? Especially if you don't even know what you're looking for, like that last one. Uh, and they definitely have these catastrophic consequences. Um, and some of the bug is the bugs are kind of indistinguishable from malware because you can start to speculate and start to wonder. There's this nice plausible deniability. Um, some of these issues we could find automatically, like the Apple go to SSL fail or go to fail bug. Um, we could find that automatically pretty easy, right? But some of them, not at all, because we don't even know how to specify you know, what what that bug is. We haven't thought of it. Yet. And these novel attacks, like the last one, are just, if you, if you don't have that concept or that hypothesis, you're just not going to find it. Um, so the whole thought was, you know, there's this kind of overlap, right? We have antivirus looking for malware. We have program analysis tools looking for bugs, right? But there's this kind of, kind of gray area in between. And just my question is, are we doing ourselves a disservice by trying to separate these, right? Um, so let's say you compromise a machine, and you're going to upload malware. Maybe you don't upload malware. What if you upload a bug or a program with a bug, right? Because now you're forcing your antivirus tool to find bugs in software. We know that we're not good at finding bugs in software. Right? Um, so yeah, so there's a little bit of overlap there. And okay, so what can we do about this? Is where we kind of start uh, trying to come up with answers, right? So we have this growing infrastructure. The complexity of software keeps growing and growing and growing. Uh, and this manual work is expensive. It's hard for people to just sit down and audit software because there's just so much of it. And even if we do that, it's, you know, we're not very good at it. People are looking at the OpenSSL for a long time and doing lots of manual audits. Uh, but we, you know, we still didn't find the bug. Um, and it's, it's expensive to do that even if we were good at finding the bugs. Right? It's just expensive to pay humans to do this. So we can't automate it all. Um, there's this kind of cat and mouse game, right? And it's, it's just hard to find in general. Um, so we need some sort of process to at least increase the human productivity because we know the automated tools aren't doing it, um, but it's too cost expensive for it's too expensive for for humans to do. So we need some kind of way to increase human productivity. Um, and so this is kind of a, a concept that came out of the U.S. Air Force. So they have something called the OODA loop. Um, and I like this quote by Richard Schneider, which says, "Security is a process, not a product." Right? You have to. It's an ongoing process. You're not going to just buy an off-the-shelf solution, which is going to solve this for you. Um, OK, so let's go to the OODA loop. So the OODA loop was kind of um, designed to explain kind of the, the superiority of US Air Force pilots. So if you say you're a US Air Force pilot, and say there's a Russian MiG coming at you, uh, and you're in this kind of dogfight, you're, you're both going through this process. So you go through this process of observe, observe orient, decide, and act. Right? So you see this Russian MiG coming at you and say, OK, um, so I, I see the MIG, um, and now I orient that information. I start to synthesize it and make sense of it. So I say, okay, what do I know about Russian MIGs? Well, they can fly fast, but they can't take sharp turns. Take something like that. Right? So we decide what we're going to do. Um, I say, okay, I'm going to take a really sharp turn because I can, and then maybe they'll overshoot us, and they'll give us some more time to think. Um, and then I'll act. I'll go through that process, implement it, 
Uh, and then I'm going to repeat this loop, right? And you're both going through this process. And the important part is to go through this process, uh, do a quality job going through this process, but to do this quickly, right? And if you can do it quickly, you essentially get inside the other person's real loop, right? So if you can decide and act before your opponent has a chance to observe and orient himself to the new information, you win that fight. Um, so our opponent, if we're thinking about software, um, of course there's this evolution of malware. If you're building tools to detect, uh, anti if you're building antivirus tools to detect malware, um, you know your your opponent's going through the same process as you. Um, but if you if you want to remove that, you can just think about time, right? The longer these bugs are out there, the more impact they have because they get kind of uh, disseminated into other software with our open source culture, um, and you know they they get they they could be exploited longer, right? So we want to find these bugs as quick as possible. And uh, Fred Brooks, uh, who's a Turing Award winner, uh, has this, this nice little equation I like. So he says, IA is greater than AI, right? So intelligence amplification is IA, and AI, artificial intelligence, is, is AI, right? So he says, basically, um, a human's always going to be better than a machine in, in terms of, of um, kind of the thinking, the reasoning capability. But a machine can do things very quickly, uh, right, and can, can kind of brute force out a solution. But a human with a machine is going to be kind of the blend and the best of those both worlds. Uh, so this is what we, we set out to build was an IA device, right? So something that could amplify human intelligence and ask, let us do this analysis of software a little better. Um, so I won't, like, I'm not trying to promote this atlas or anything, but this is something that we've built here at Iowa State and uh, with the company um, at the research park. So basically we'll do something like we'll take the source code or the byte code or whatever um, fragment of the program that we have, uh, we'll start to um, basically mine the relationships out of that program and then build a uh, program graph, right? So in this case, this is the, the structural relationships and all of the call relationships between those uh, functions. And then we can ask uh, questions about that, right? So after we've kind of created the relationships with the control flow, the data flow, all the, the structural information, uh, we have kind of a, a queryable da graph database where we can say, uh, is there ever a flow from, from this sensitive source to this confidential uh, sync or uh, sensitive sync? And uh, there's a two-way correspondence, so once you have an answer in the graph, you can relate back to the source code and you can um, jump between the two. And we're kind of going through this OODA loop process using this tool. Um, so with Android, we're given uh, an Android application, uh, and ultimately within some time frame, we have to accept or reject that application, whether we're going to let it into an app store or not. And uh, with that, that decision, we have to produce some evidence of you know, why we made that decision, right? So really, we're, we're kind of creating a hypothesis about that software, asking a question, uh, and then kind of going through this feedback loop of, okay, it doesn't do this, but it doesn't do this, and we'll go eventually go through that feedback loop and say, okay, I accept this application because it doesn't do all of these things which I've defined as that, right? Um, but of course, it's still hard. How do you find that, that novel attack? Because you may not think of it. Um, so that's, that's still an open problem. Um, okay, and so we could do this for uh, source code and binary, and I won't go to that, but I have, I have demos if people want to watch this. Um, okay, so then I, I started kind of thinking about things, right? So uh, I wrote a spell checker, and then I just went back and I inverted all the logic. So I created something I call spell record, so it creates typos, uh, but realistic typos. And I thought, okay, what if we you know, took, say, like a spell checking application, and um, you know, we, we put this spell checker in there instead. How are you going to find that, right? Because you have to come up with that hypothesis. So I had this thing, it's kind of fun. Um, and then I even kind of hooked it into your typing speed. So the faster you type, the more typos it creates. And then as you slow down, it starts to behave again. Um, just to make it really frustrating. And then the tool that I wanted to do, I wanted to embed this in, say, like a runtime library application. So it would affect every application. Um, and so this is what I wrote for DEF CON. Um, and so I'll come to that in a minute. Okay, so um, just like the spell checker, I wanted to kind of hypothesize, you know, a, a potential malware. So we have things like a fly-by-wire on planes, right? But uh, cars are also becoming drive-by-wire, and so one of the things is for like trucks or SUVs, things with a high center of gravity, we have this electronic stability control unit. So as you shift lanes, um, they had a high potential of rolling over just because they have a high center of gravity. So what this does is kind of measure your center of gravity, gravity, and as you shift lanes, it'll actually break all four of the wheels individually in a way that reduces your, your rollover potential, right? So what if we just took something like that, like that system, and inverted all that logic, right? Do we have something like a rollover creation um, algorithm? Uh, I don't know. 
Um, but I started thinking about there's plenty of ways to, to implement this. So one kind of fun property of greedy algorithms is uh, uh, a greedy algorithm is kind of the simplest thing, right? You, you just pick the best uh, the best looking choice each time in an iteration. Um, but there's actually a property of greedy algorithms that uh, under certain circumstances, they actually produce the worst possible outcome. Um, so you can create an algorithm uh, which looks to be a benign algorithm, but uh, actually control the environment in a way that, that creates this, uh, this really bad outcome. Um, and if you're a naive uh, you know, auditor and you don't know these properties of algorithms, you might miss that. Right? And so the point was, um, you know, it's hard enough to find these legitimate bugs in our software, but how are we ever going to have any hope of finding the illegitimate bugs? And that was my fear at the time. Um, yeah, question? So, yeah. so in that case, it sounds like, so what you're saying is, well, okay, if I can twiddle the sensor responses to make the algorithm misbehave, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so that's... Well, I, I don't know if you have to just right? twiddle the... the yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's hypothetical, so I don't know what you control in the environment. But maybe, yeah, maybe there's something you control in the environment to, to produce that effect. So, yeah. so just just thinking about sort of where you're going, where I think you're going with the mm -hmm. So a long time ago, um, like when I was in grad school, we worried a lot about understanding flaws. A lot of people spent a lot of masters and PhD trying to understand vulnerability mm -hmm. from a software perspective. And then Meyer came along and threw all that away. And <laughs> right, the decided CDs. that instead of understanding anything, we come up with laundry lists right. and give them numbers. Right. Right. And then they back up and they try to come up with some categories that had numbers and right. like that. And didn't really talk about understanding of any report. Right, because that's kind of a reactive approach. Right. And if you're a DOD, if you're in a DOD setting, the reactive approach doesn't work, right? Because you've already been compromised or the bugs already happened, right? You need some proactive approach. Right, right, right. So, so my question is, so kind of knowing that you're, you're working in this area, my question yeah. is, can you go back to the work that was done around mining? Hmm, I remember some of the stuff in your, in your, yeah, reverse engineering was. Yeah, there were entire, there were entire pieces written about classic. Yeah abilities and talking about like okay what's and, and they weren't the best yeah right because there's no way yeah so I mean to answer your question no I guess I'm not aware of something that stood out to me um, but maybe I just don't know maybe well, I'm not looking in the right area so well, I, I can point you to it because a lot of it's yeah, be interesting. not in the places where you look these days yeah right some of these conferences don't exist anymore. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I'd be interested to, right. to learn so, more about so, those. Yeah, so I, I wonder. I'm just, I'm just thinking, wondering if because of the time we didn't have tools. Yeah, and now you've got tools. So uh, the best answer I've come up with for a proactive approach is you have to have this human in the loop approach. You can't trust your tool, but I still don't know. You know what happens if the human can't hypothesize what the malware is? I, I still don't have an answer for that. I don't know. Right. right. If if some other human is just a little sneakier than you, I don't know. And that's that's kind of what I was trying to convey is is you can be really crafty about this, and and that's what scares me because I don't have an answer for that. Right. Yeah. No, no, I, I agree. I agree. I'm just because I'm thinking about this sort of reactive. Yeah. Reactive stuff. Right? right. Right. I'm not trying to sideline you. Know, no, 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 no. You're fine. You're fine. But it's unique. Uh, uh, it's all right, so it's working. Uh, there's, um, it's a legitimate greedy algorithm. Mm -hmm. But it has a methodological sure, sure. magnitude that you don't have to control. I mean, it could naturally occur in practice. You don't care whether they could change. So you want to make sure that at some legitimate uh, operating point, you will fail very badly. Yeah. Uh, so it's pretty much more of what you're kind of talking about is perhaps. Mapping of some benign states from the physical world into the yeah, so I think visual world, and that's the problem that it's pretty hard to do. I mean, I mean, yeah, so I had this idea of a spell wrecker and a spell checker. Right. Well, well, so let's look at any of the other examples, right? Yeah. That we're building up to. Right? So, so you know, you're building up to a lot of these examples. Yeah. Right. 
one thing I one thing I ask is I always look at these problems when we, when we have these failures. I always look and try to figure out where in software. I always try to figure out what did the developer. This doesn't this doesn't get into that. I always try to get into the mind of the developer and say, what assumption did that guy? Right. 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 Where did he or she say? Okay, I'm going to assume this is true, and there's going to be some failure mode where it's not true that the attacker can influence, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, one of those was an, one of those was an assumption that the hardware was going to operate properly, right? 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 I mean, you're memory. Yeah, you're memory. I mean, typically at the software level, you assume your hardware works, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. That level is pretty hard to defend against the general purpose software so yeah. you know that your hardware will, if, if your memory is unreliable. Right, but if you know about something like that attack, then you can start to look, okay, maybe these type of structures, which take advantage of that, have a certain structure to them, so maybe I'll start looking for that. Well, but if you don't know that assumption, yeah. you're hopeless. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's, that's, where I, that's where I'm, that's just kind of my, yeah. that, that's my sort of, Point I think is it might be worthwhile to go back and look at the category. Yeah. Category. No, this this is the, this is the point of this talk was yeah. to was to start this discussion. Just to go back and say, okay, what are the categorizations of these assumptions? Yeah. That, that were that were talked about way back when, and so can I put those? Can I somehow figure out a way to leverage your tools? Yeah. Right. Because that at least. Brings up the level of AI more, and I can, you know, yes, right, right. right. Of course, you want to load, you want to increase the, yeah. the AI as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Get the recipes for the assumptions. Yeah. Right. And then you can automatically detect some types of assumptions that were made in the code, right? That, yeah. You know, like like you were saying, like the the, the, the stupid partly thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where you assume <laughs> that where you assume that a uh, yeah. yeah. Right. Why was that even in the protocol to send the message? <laughs> and you assume the user provided input is our interest in input. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, and all these things were things that were talked about way back then. Okay. Okay, so let's talk off. Yeah, I'll that'd be great. Slides, so, but, okay, well, actually, this, this, this is a good point for this discussion because at this point, we're going to take a completely kind of abrupt turn. So, like I said earlier, I gave this first part of this talk at, at DerbyCon. Um, and then what I wanted to do was take that spell checker and actually embed it in the Java virtual machine just to kind of mess with everything. Um, and it turns out, uh, you know, people had proposed this, uh, that, that idea um, about seven years earlier, but there's not a very good way to do it and there's no available tools. Um, so this was uh, my summer project. So I created this, uh, a tool to do this uh, and presented it at DEF CON, uh, which is a pretty big thing for me. So I'm just gonna, you know, everyone's written this program, um, so I'm just gonna demo it real quick here. Um, so if we open Eclipse here, uh, and we have our Hello World program, let me make the font a little bigger. Okay. Edit, let's try 18 maybe. Okay. So if we go ahead and uh, run this program, it works, hello world, right? Um, but if I run it with a, a modified environment, uh, in this case, it prints hello world backwards. So I don't know if you guys could see that or not, but uh, it came out backwards. So that's, that's you know, something, something happened there. Uh, and, and what happened? Well, uh, we have to ask some questions about how does Java work? So, um, so there's nothing wrong with the program. I didn't change the Hello World program at all. Um, what I did change was the, the runtime libraries of, of Java itself. Um, so Java has this nice kind of cross-platform uh, property, right? We take our Java files, we compile it with the Java compiler, it outputs these, the bytecode, the class files, right? Uh, and then if we have a bunch of those class files, we just zip them all up and re-unzip to that jar because we're Java and we like jar files. Um, but jar files are just zip files. And, um, we take that jar file and we run it, and somehow it can run on Mac, Windows, and uh, Linux, right, without without changing that program. Um, and so this is what they call write once, run anywhere. Um, so the way that we do that right, is we have something in between which interprets the bytecode and runs it on the on the system, right? So everybody's seen this 
on site two with Component 7. Um, but if we look inside of that, it has all the runtime libraries, so the definition of object, all your networking APIs, um, uh, integers, everything is defined inside those runtime libraries. Um, but what happens if we start messing with that, right? So it actually uh, will affect any application which runs on top of that, that um, library. because so we've kind of changed the interpretation of it, right? Um, and so there's quite a few advantages to doing this. Um, one, we compromise every Java program or every uh, runtime program uh, for that language. Um, we can create this kind of application context-aware rootkit, which is kind of fun. Um, and I, I can go into that later, but it, uh, I'll leave that for now. Um, out of sight, out of mind, right? So, so forensic uh, investigators don't always think to audit here, so they could kind of overlook that. Um, platform independent, um, and it's a fully featured runtime, so we can write our malware and object our languages. We have lots of support libraries. Uh, and we can even mess with things like the keyboard, so it's, we can still make our you know, key logger and rootkit. Right? So there's lots of little level of you guys that are, are wrapped in the, the runtime. Um, so how do we do this, right? So this is this was my kind of engineering approach. So I thought about um, what do I have access to, right? So I can just open the, the bytecode uh, itself uh, in the hex editor. Um, and my first version, I, I did this, I tried. Uh, it's a lot of work. Um, so this totally works, but it's a lot of work um, because say you do something like change the name of a function, well now you have to go to every call site where that function is called and update it, right? Um, if you change uh, any of the stack parameters, you have to go and recalculate stack frames, it's just a pain in the butt. Um, so we have something called intermediate representation. So um, uh, malware does this a lot for Android. Um, so we decompile the Android app into kind of a halfway point, it's not source code, um, but we can edit that intermediate representation and then recompile it. Um, so this is nice, uh, we do this, we use this uh, for our dark project now. Um, this one's called uh, Jimple. This works, uh, but if you're a developer, nobody really develops in an intermediate representation. Like, um, this, this is not quite source, but you still have types. Um, you don't have any loops, so you, uh, you only have go-tos and labels. Um, so it's, it's kind of a mess, but you can read it. Um, so kind of tricky, not, not ideal. Ideally, you'd like to just you know, decompile the, the code you want, uh, recompile, uh, edit the code or recompile it, but this doesn't always work. Um, decompilers aren't that great, um, and there's a lot of places where they break. So the idea was, uh, you know, ideally, we'd like to, to work with just source code, um, but make these binary modifications. Um, and so I came up with a way that will do that. Uh, the previous work was, uh, to use this kind of intermediate representation, they kind of copy paste stuff in there. Uh, they did this for .NET, um, but this is a tool that I created. It lets you actually create the rootkit in source code, and we do this using um, kind of an annotation framework. It's a, a builder plugin into Eclipse, so you still have your uh, familiar uh, uh, environment, development environment. Um, you can create a module which uh, you can, it's actually a Metasploit module, you can uh, run it on your victim, and it makes all the modifications for the JVM there. Um, and it's free and open source. So there was uh, some early reviews on Twitter about this. Um, it was like, great, just what the internet needs, another well-engineered malware development tool set. And uh, I took this as a compliment because it was well-engineered. Um, so anyway, um, I will give you a demo of how to, how to write it. So I said everyone in here should probably be able to do it. So these are the, really the only annotations you need to um, know. There's a few others for dealing with things like uh, static methods and whatnot, but, uh, or private, sorry, private classes, uh, or final classes. Uh, so if you want to insert a, a function or a field or um, a new class, uh, there's a, you can define it or you can redefine it. Um, it over inserts or replaces some logic in the, the target. Um, or you can preserve the old logic, but add kind of a wrapper interface. Um, so we're gonna use this merge one. I wanna create, um, I wanna modify the file API. So we're going to create a hidden file. So one that uh, if you ask if it exists, it lies and always says, no, it doesn't. But if it's any other file, it will just behave, you know, whether or not. Uh, it'll behave uh, like normal. So let's go ahead and create that. Um, so I have a, a hidden file here. Um, so if we're good developers, we should write some test code first to make sure that um, you know, it works. So what does this do? It creates a file called secret file. Uh, it writes to that file, just writes the string block, closes it, and then asks if it exists. So we know it exists because we just wrote it, right? Um, and then just kind of clean up, we, we uh, delete the file a little bit. Okay, so I'll run this with the, the standard runtime, uh, and it says, uh, yes, the file exists. So we'd like this to say false, 
because um, it's a hidden file. So what I'm going to do is uh, use, actually, let's make this a little bigger so we can see. I'm going to use uh, the standard development environment. The way that we override something is, uh, um, sorry, actually, um, the, the way that we specify the target that we want to modify is by extending the class. Um, so like I said earlier, there are some constructs for saying, uh, no, this is not a final class, so yes, it's okay to extend it, or if it's a private class or something, we can uh, still override it. So um, let's just go ahead and make this compile. So um, this is just in there. We don't have any annotations on it, so nothing, nothing happens here. But I want to define a new exist method. Um, so this exist method, I'm overriding the one in the, the, the original definition. I'm going to say merge this logic, so preserve the, preserve the original exist method, uh, but then um, replace the, the main interface with this one. So what does this one do? Well, if it's a file um, and it's not a directory, and the file's name is secret file, then just return false. Otherwise, just do what you would normally do, use the default behavior. So if we go ahead and uh, run this guy, it's a builder, so it's already built here. I'm going to go back to the test class. And uh, if I run this as a, uh, with the, the modified library, uh, it lies and says the file does not exist. So let's look and see the changes that it did underneath. I'm just going to pull up a, a decompiler. Oops. Okay, my decompiler is broken. Um, I think I might have pictures of it. No, I don't. Okay. Um, so I can download it real quick. Gooey. Yeah. Okay, there we go, great. So I'm gonna pull out, this is the modified runtime here. Um, so I'm gonna go just decompile this. Let's go look at the uh, file API. So that's in Java, IO, file. And let's uh, look at the, the original exist method. Uh, or sorry, this is the new exist method. So it's the, the exact code that we wrote. If it's a file and the file name is secret file, then return false. Otherwise, return uh, what used to be, uh, which is now a renaming method called JRF exists. So I'll jump to that. And this is the original um, exists method, which I've made private, so you can't, you don't, you don't see it anymore, right? Um, so this is pretty easy. You can just use source code, um, and these annotations really just define how you want to merge into the, the runtime. Um, so I, this was um, kind of the, the quick overview of how that works, and um, in the, the DEF CON talk, I really just kind of spent a long time messing with uh, the runtime. Um, I did quite a few things. Uh, someone had ported all of uh, Doom into pure Java, so just to show you can really shove whatever you want in the runtime, I embedded all of Doom, and if you uh, call a method called Beetlejuice three times, it launches Doom. Right, so you can uh, you can do all sorts of things with reflection and looking at the call stack to know when you want to trigger your malware. Um, there's all sorts of fun stuff there. Um, okay, so then um, just for fun, uh, at the very beginning we talked about this, right? So this was the uh, at DerbyCon night we had created this uh, this kind of refactored the this this exploit against Java, which was two years old. At this point, it's been uh, four years old. So I thought let's just revisit this, right? Um, so I revisited uh, this malware I went through, um, and in 2014, yes, you can still get past all antivirus uh, with actually the exact same changes that I made in 2012, uh, or 2014, sorry. Um, although I did this again about a month after DEF CON was over, and two antiviruses had blocked the technique that I was doing, so maybe someone was watching this time. Um, so that's kind of fun. Uh, so that was kind of the update. Um, and then what I thought was, okay, you remember we can just upload a vulnerability, right? So upload the vulnerability, and uh, of course nobody detects the vulnerability, right? Um, so, oh, sorry, this was the, the, the 2016 score. So we got a little bit better and we gained a, another player in the antivirus game. Um, so I thought, let's upload the vulnerability. So I did something I called a reverse bug patch. So we're going to add the bug patch back in. 
So they had fixed this in Java 7. Uh, you know, the exploit doesn't work at all. Um, but it's really easy to add it back because all they did was add two, two checks. So let's just go back in and remove those two checks. And they had moved a class, so that's okay. I'll just restore it for them, right? Um, and now in Java 8, this um, browser drive-by totally works again, right? And what's fun is the exploits already exist in Metasploit. Um, so I was able to just reuse the same exploits um, by patching the sorry, the, um, the vulnerability. So I'm just gonna play a video of that, it's kind of fun. Um, let's go back here. Okay, so this is a, the 2012 exploit, which now totally works against Java 8, uh, assuming you've been compromised. Um, okay, so um, the caveat is you've already been compromised, this is post-exploitation activity. Right, so someone already has a, a session on your machine, this is Metasploit, so someone's already hacked your machine, this is our Windows victim. Um, if they were to um, go to a compromised website, um, right, I, I pulled up the console here, uh, but normally nothing pops up. So they were to run this, this, uh, um, this exploit, the original exploit, um, and it crashes in Java 8 because they fixed the bug so the class doesn't exist anymore. I used some reflection. But let's go ahead and let's um, rewrite the runtime um, with the, the exploit that we have. So you know, using the same thing that we did with the with the um, the hidden file, we basically create the same thing, which unpatches the, the bug fix. Um, go ahead and run this uh, module, that exploit module, which takes the, the the bug the reverse bug patch, whatever you want to call it. Um, so now, if you go back to the Windows victim and you go to that same uh, drive-by website and you were to run the the, the Java applet, um, we don't get a crash actually, um, we get another session because uh, the exploit was successful. So you can see down here there's two sessions open. Um, and so nobody detects this, um, and that's because we're not looking for bugs when we do Android. So, um, so anyway, this is kind of fun. Um, I don't know what the, the kind of the purpose of it would be, um, but it, it scares me. So, <laughs> um, How do you inject the GRE libraries? How do I inject them? Um, okay, so there's there are a few requirements. I said it's post exploitation, right? So you have to be uh, you have to have a, an administrator uh, privilege on on your victim machine already, okay. right? And so the JREs, if you install them right, are in like the program files directory or in Linux, like the user, not user yeah, I think it is user bin actually. Um, so in order to edit those, you have to have root or administrator permission. Yeah. So with this one, um, I just used the PS exec module in Metasploit, which means I had the, the account credentials. Um, but then I used this is this was uh, Windows a fresh Windows seven install. Um, but I used Metasploit's uh, default auto escalate permission, so it was able to escalate me up using local tricks um, to get me to the administrator permission, and then I could rewrite the runtime. So instead of uploading malware, I just rewrite the runtime. And now I can come back later. In this case, I have to get them to go to a, a browser drive by. Um, oh, I can just show. So if you right click on any of these and go to, so in, in your Eclipse project here, like the hidden file, we go to export, um, and then there's a Jerry payload dropper. You take this in your Metasploit module, and you can compromise any victim with whatever you wrote in the Eclipse ID. Uh, and this is nice because it's Java, um, it's a virtual machine, right? So instead of this write, one, write once run anywhere, we have kind of a write once exploit anywhere property. So we can still preserve that. Um, okay, so that's really it. Um, I can uh, take questions or whatever you guys want to talk about. I think actually I'm 10 minutes over, so. Um, the tools open source, it's, there's even tutorials and stuff for it. Um, and Atlas is a, a tool, it's free for academic use if anyone wants to play with that. Um, or if anyone wants to talk more about this stuff offline, I'm happy to talk to him and Dr. Daniels, we can, we can talk about uh, what we were talking about earlier. So. Um, but thank you guys very much for inviting me. I appreciate talking. Okay. Thanks,
sort of general purpose runtime systems like Java and other, yep. other things like that. Yeah, any of these, in fact, the JVM is really powerful because um, so many languages have been imported to the Java virtual machine. If you can compromise just the Java virtual machine, you actually impact you know, Bojer, Jython, JRuby, all those. Right, so I think, <clears throat> so, so maybe what your demonstration is actually suggesting mm -hmm. is that any time where we have these really powerful systems, like the JVM, yeah. um, I don't know how Python works these days, but, but it has to have some sort of yeah. VM, and it's an interpreter, but, yeah. but something, right? Yeah. That maybe that's where we need to be thinking about integrity and signature check. Yeah, so this is, this is easy to detect, right? Just make sure that it's one of your whitelisted Java virtual machine runtime libraries in your system. Yeah. Right, but but from a systems perspective, that does tend to because the reason people don't use things like tripwire approaches yeah. is the simply maintaining the uh, sure. Well, I mean, you can you can keep going levels deeper too, right? Like, um, so there's a, a program called Backdoor Factory, which is kind of fun, and it embeds like. Um, in these kind of code caves, it adds uh, executable. So I was thinking about, um, I haven't done it yet, but I was going to compromise the Java update binary. So every time Java updates, you just re, you, you make your modification on the update process, right? So, yeah. Right, you're just writing down for Thompson. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right, you write your own Yeah, yeah, I'll just keep going deeper. Right. Right. Yeah, so, but I think you're saying, okay, we've got to watch the integrity of. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's you have to consider the whole system, right? Like, you don't, you, it's the same thing, like, if you don't trust the hardware, right, then your software can be malicious, or, yeah, I don't know. I guess um, this talk's funny because I, I, I kind of just throw out a lot of things that scare me, but I don't have a lot of answers for them. <laughs> um, but it gets me to think, and I hope it gets other people Can you push Oracle or OpenJDK to include uh, integrity checks on courses that lie? Um, I don't think it's on Oracle to do it. Um, because, um, I, you know, who, who, like, where the checks, could, when the check's going to be done is probably something that's more done. Like, say you have, like, a, a TPM or trusted, um, what's it called? Yeah, TPM. Um, you know where is you know where is the check made? I don't know if Oracle is in a position to to do enforce that check. It's probably something more like a software like Tripwire that's going to go through and hash selected files. Um, so really, this you, know, you, you should hash this file. Um, you know the Java runtime should be considered. Um, although, <clears throat> if you given the premise that you're already compromised, maybe it's too late for you anyway. Like you've already lost. You know, it, in order to do this attack, you have to be root on the victim. Um, so at this point, doing the integrity check here probably doesn't matter because maybe I'll just compromise that too. Oh, and actually, that's a funny thing, right? So the Java runtime library is not signed. Yeah, that's what I meant. Though. Right? But, but if it was signed, I'm just going to go disable the the sign the, the signing logic, which is also done in Java, right? Like, so I'm already root on your machine. It's already game over for you. So I don't know. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's the that's the real trick. Um, you only kind of got two options. You either got to have some other level of protection. Yeah. Or you've got to do something that's. Uh, this is more about not getting caught after the fact, right? Kind of being right. stealthy, right? Yeah. And well, you got to do something. You got to add something. Else. You gotta add some non-determinism to the system in some way that, yeah. that it's not so trivial. Yeah. You know, that, that's kind of the way you go about it. Oh yeah, I had lots of fun. Um, I mean that reminds me of I went and replaced the secure random with just re with just regular random and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah you can be that's a terrible thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So well, thanks for coming guys. Thank you. Okay.